Good morning. Um, welcome to the first meeting of the Scrutiny Committee. Um, I'm Brian Perry, I'm Democratic Services Manager, for those who don't know me. Just to say that before we start the meeting proper, we've got a procedural matter to deal with. Uh, the convener, Councillor McCabe, uh, is unable to join us today, so we need to appoint a chair for today's meeting. Normally for scrutiny committees, that would be a member from the opposition. Um, in terms of the people that actually joined us in the room today, we have Councillor Aitchison, who unfortunately is unwell and would rather not take the chair this morning, obviously. So, who would uh, would be in and out, as he's just said. So, I'm going to ask for nominations from people who are in the room. We have Councillor Bissett, uh, sorry, Provost Bissett joining us uh, remotely, um, but we had a discussion beforehand that it would probably be more appropriate that it's somebody that's joined us physically who, who takes the chair. So to that end, I'm going to ask if there's any nominations to take the chair this morning. I would like to, nor to nominate Lorna Binney. I second that. OK, thank you. So Councillor Binney's been nom nominated now. Normally it's a member of the opposition who takes the chair, but in the circumstances it's appropriate that it's a member of the administration who takes the chair for this meeting. So I'll ask Councillor Binney to, to join me at the top table. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming along to the scrutiny committee today in the town hall. You will be aware it's a hybrid meeting and looking at the screen, I can see we have a lot of people actually uh, working from home, which is really good. Um, the meeting itself, um, I would like full participation. I think that's very, very important. Um, so I'm now going to start the meeting. Uh, start of business, one apologies. Do we have any apologies? Uh, we do, convener. Thank you. We've got Councillor McClare, as I intimated at the start of the meeting. We also have apologies from Councillor Brown and Councillor Anslow. Moving on slightly to declarations of interest. Would any members declare any financial or non-financial interest they have in any item of the business of this meeting? Identifying the relevant agenda item, and the nature of the business. Is that none? None. Thank you. We now move on to the minute. The minute of the meeting of the scrutiny committee that was held on the 24th of March. It's pages 2 to 16. And it would be helpful if anybody was at that uh, scrutiny committee on that date because we do have a lot of new members who perhaps weren't at that meeting, if they could agree the meeting or not, agree the, the, the minute or not. I think convener looking at that and on that basis, it's just yourself who's at that meeting. Right. So if you're happy to. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to agree those minutes. And just to double check the, the committee are happy to formally agree it's a correct record. Agreed, agreed. Now, moving on uh, to the rolling action log, which is pages 7 to 10. If it helps, convener, the, the rolling action log just shows uh, those actions or actions that are going to result in further reports coming back to the, the scrutiny committee in due course. There are a number of reports, as members will see, starting on page 6. Each one has got progress set aside from, from the various services on where the reports are. There's none. Um, outstanding that don't have explanations given, so it's just a case of members going through their own action log. If they want to ask any questions, they can do so, but really it's just for noting. So if there is any comments or any questions, but uh, you'll probably see, as Brian says, most of it is in <coughs> progress at the moment, but if anything that uh, stands out that you want to ask a question on, feel free. Uh, Councillor Aitchison. Thank you. It's um, 596 for um, children's services. We had the inspection on the 7th of July um, for the 
um, ran an early learning centre. Do we know when the report will be up forthcoming after that? Mr Naylor, uh, is it possible you could answer that question, please? Yes, there's been a follow up um, and that will be uh, reported within a, a report that's going to the Education Junior Young People Executive uh, a week on Tuesday. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Robertson, do you have a question? Yes, uh, can we get this report before the end of the year? Because it's very important that uh, we can't do our business unless we have these reports. Yes. Uh, Mr Naylor, is that possible we can get the report by the end of the year? As I've said, it will be reported uh, a week on Tuesday at the committee. That's fine, Mr. Naylor, but it's this this committee that's asking for a report, the scrutiny committee. So we'd like one for the end of the year. Is that possible? Yes. Thank you. It's maybe just worth saying at this point, the next item of business is the local bench, local government benchmarking framework. This is a report to do with performance, which means that all members of council are have been invited to participate in today's meeting. The scrutiny committee will be the ones that take any decisions or follow any actions, but um, other members of council have joined the committee today. They, they've joined us online and of course they're welcome to ask, and que ask questions to the chair. Thank you. Marking framework uh, and the report will be taken by Rebecca McDonald. Thanks. Um, thank you, convener, and good morning, everyone. Um, this is an annual report to scrutiny looking at the local government benchmarking framework, which is a set of benchmarking performance indicators known shorthand as the LGBF. So the LGBF is a national approach to preparing, comparing and improving the performance of councils in Scotland. It's compiled by the Improvement Service on behalf of SOLACE. So there's lots of indicators and information in this report. It covers Falkirk Council's LGBF performance from 2020 to 2021. And so it takes us through to the 31st of March 2021. We're obviously in September 2022, but there is typically a year or so lag in results being reported for the LGBF due to the time it takes for each council to submit their data and for the improvement service to collate, analyse, calibrate and publish it. So it ultimately shows the comparative performance data for Scottish councils, as I've already mentioned. Important to note that the period covered in this report was impacted by the pandemic and the LGB results that we have shows the impact of the first year of COVID-19 on local government services. So councils reacted independently to many of the operational challenges faced at that time and as a result of that there are some gaps in the data where councils experienced service delivery challenges and had difficulty catching some of the data that might have been included in this LGBF report. And with these challenges, the data captured is perhaps not representative of the normal results you would expect for normal times, but they are reflective of the operating environment at that time, and to some extent the operating environment that still affects some key service areas as a result of COVID-19. But I guess to give some assurance um, to the scrutiny committee, the improvement service is working to improve the consistency for each set of performance measures across councils and is working with the Scottish Government to try and obtain any missing or delayed data where possible. That said, most of the local government benchmarking indicators have now been published and there's just a small number that remain and uh, where 
where possible, they will be published in due course. But I'd like to just say to members that the Falkirk Council results for LGBF are on the Council website and it's on a portal called My Local Council, which is available for general public scrutiny. Um, so, so that's there. But moving on to the body of the report, there are four main parts to reference in the report. Firstly, it's to show what has happened with our own performance between the years of 2019-20 and 2020-21. So what has been the shift in performance between those years? So paragraph 6.3 shows the shift in Falkirk Council's performance and it tells us that 37% of indicators are improving, 57% of indicators are deteriorating and 2% of indicators showed no movement. There is a residual remaining 4% of indicators that relate to financial sustainability. Now they actually report accounting principles to which there's no prescribed direction of travel. So for those financial indicators, we can't say they're better, worse or the same. They're just factual accounting records that we take note of. And given the, the circumstances of that first year of the pandemic, it's a difficult comparison to make between an ostensibly normal operating year in 1920 and how things had to work in 2021 to respond to events at that time. That said, there's still some positives recorded and that there was a marked improvement in 37% of our LGBF performance areas. Um, but really at this stage, I'd like to just make members aware that the granular detail of this particular set of results and indeed the full suite of LGBF results is in the appendix to the report. And um, so that's available for further scrutiny. So that was a comparison between 1920 and 2021. The second area to draw attention to is how the council's performance looked during 2021 compared with other councils in Scotland. So this is set out in paragraph 6.4 and it shows how our results compared nationally during the first year of the pandemic. So a brief overview of those results tells us that 50% of indicators performed better than the Scottish average. 46% did not perform as well as the Scottish average, 1% performed the same as the Scottish average, and the remaining 3% of results again relate to financial sustainability section where there's no directional movement as mentioned before. These are factual records. But again, we say to members that the granular detail of these results is in the appendix. Um, and although there's some mixed results in that section against how we perform to Scottish average, there's a lean to an overall positive position with so, insofar as 50% of our indicators did perform better than the Scottish average and 1% stayed the same. But it's a difficult year to take account of um, that first year of the pandemic. The third part of the report to reference is twofold. It's an update on what things we are good at, so service areas that rank in the top quartile of Scotland results. And it also gives an update on what we're not so good at. So those sort of service areas which rank in the bottom quartile. So these are set out for review and consideration in paragraph 6.5 to 6.7. Um, and I appreciate that members may wish to ask questions on these and um, would invite colleagues from relevant service leads that are here today um, to be on board to take any of those questions at the end of this report. The fourth area in the report to highlight is how the indicators tie into the forthcoming council plan. The initial thinking for this is set out in paragraph 6.8 and links to the development work underway on the new plan. So many members on the call today will recall that there was an open invitation to attend engagement workshops last week to feed into how the plan could be shaped. Now, from a performance perspective, the plan aims to include a range of LGBF performance indicators, as well as what we would call local indicators that tie in with the proposed vision in the plan, the proposed priorities, and collectively these performance indicators should help us monitor our performance against the key projects and key actions charted within the new plan. So to do this performance monitoring, um, it's important to note that alongside the council plan that will be reported to council at the end of September, there will be something that we call a performance management framework. And that update will show the proposed cycle of reporting 
to members, officers and the public on how we are progressing with the Council plan and the associated work within it. So future performance result reports with a focus on the indicators in the new Council plan will come to scrutiny accordingly. And so, convener, maybe just to conclude a few final thoughts. The local government benchmark framework is the best that we have in comparing our performance against other councils. These LGBF results, alongside other key performance measures, have been central to the thoughts that we've had on how we will move performance management forward in the council and channeling that through the proposed council plan. In February this year, Council agreed the Best Value Strategic Action Plan, and that covered a number of themes, including a series of performance related actions. The new Council Plan, if approved, would bring these performance actions to life. The groundwork has already been done and will enable a refreshed approach to scrutinising not only future LGBF results, but a range of performance results that will cover the full extent of the proposed new Council Plan. But I'll end there, convener, and we'll look to hand over to the Chief Executive. So in the LGBF report, it says that the Chief Executive of Falkirk Council is the chair of the Local Government Benchmarking Framework Board, which leads the, the overall development of the national framework. So at this point, convener, um, I'd like to hand over to the Chief Executive. Thank you for some final thoughts. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, um, convener, and thank you, um, um, Rebecca, I don't have a great deal um, to, to add, but um, Rebecca is right to um, make the point that this is a national approach to you know, preparing, comparing and improving um, performance. And it is in partnership with the Improvement Service you know, run by local government and for local government. And um, whilst it's by no means a perfect system, and there is some it can be some criticism of it. It's always worth reminding people what came before. What we had before was a um, a significant burden of statutory performance indicators um, set by the Accounts Commission, many of which were regarded as um, unhelpful. And indeed, the Accounts Commission has been very supportive in terms of uh, local government taking forward this work to develop its own um, performance um, framework. And it is now a key element of the statutory performance uh, reporting framework. Um, I think what's important to emphasize is it's not a simple comparative tool because there are great variations between councils in terms of scale and geography and deprivation and many other factors. So the phrase we tend to use about it is it's, it's, a, it's a can opener. It's a way of getting into a discussion and a debate about relative performance, about reasons why particular um, services are performing less well or better than they might be in other um, comparable council, councils and there is an expectation that councils will focus on those indicators that are most important uh, to them in terms of their corporate priorities um, and indeed that's the approach we're taking forward um, in our council plan. Over the over the 11 year period of the LGBF performance has improved across um, the system but both the LGBF board itself and the Accounts Commission have noted that in the context of the financial framework, this is unlikely um, to continue. So whilst the, um, it's really important we continue to um, compare and challenge ourselves on performance, the broader picture is almost inevitably we will see areas of performance um, decline in the context of the wider financial position and challenges that we face. What I would say just from the, the perspective of the LGBF board is the aim of the board is to continue to strengthen um, the LGBF, to evolve it, to ensure it um, reflects some of the um, issues and challenges which have become more prominent um, as a result of the COVID pandemic, issues around about um, cost of living and poverty and inequality, and also climate change is a relatively new um, addition to the framework just within the last couple of years. The other areas we're really focused on are trying to improve the speed um, of reporting and there's work ongoing on um, a local government data portal which would um, make the gathering and reporting of information much more um, autom automatic and we're looking at the kind of technical integration of various uh, data systems to improve that. 
And I suppose the final thing is we're trying to build momentum in the use of the framework to transform and improve uh, local government services, promoting good practice and creating um, opportunities to share practice um, and learning. So that's all um, ongoing work, but it is, I think, uh, um, a very useful tool for local government and one which, uh, despite its um, uh, some weaknesses and some frustrations sometimes in relation to particularly the timing of data, does provide us with a useful uh, tool in terms of uh, considering our own performance. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Mr. Laurie. Thank you, Rebecca. I really appreciate your input here and how important it is to, you know, to have to scrutinise council's performance against the local government benchmarking indicators. Though what I would say before I open up for questions, and I do believe we will probably have quite a lot of questions. And I was pleased to hear Rebecca as well. You spoke about consistency. That's what I've noticed as well. You know, <laughs> with this, there was a lot of data that isn't. Uh, understanding, like from one council to another, the formula they use to um, indicate their their performance in certain areas. So it's like comparing sometimes apples with oranges. We need that consistency behind that, because then, well, as far as I'm aware, or my knowledge, like if you've got benchmarking and it's not the same formula out there in all these councils, how do you know that we are actually making improvements? We need to know how that benchmarking is done. But um, I'm really pleased to hear that 37% of indicators are improving. Unfortunately, in this report, 57 are deteriorating. But you did say that this will improve in future and you're working very hard for improvements for the local government benchmarking. Framework. So I'm now going to open it up for questions. Um, Provost Bissa, I believe, had his hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Okay. Okay, thanks, Convener. Um, I think Councillor Spears had his hand up first. Thank you, Provost Bissa. Councillor Spears, would you like to ask a question? Uh, yeah, first of all, I think we would miss a great opportunity here uh, while we're looking back over our performance uh, uh, over the last two years. It would be a miss if we didn't greatly thank our frontline services, especially our refuge service, our social work service, for some of the uh, outstanding work they carried out under the most difficult of circumstances. And I think the message should go out, especially from elected members here and the scrutiny committee, of our grateful thanks to, to these people on the front line who maintained the um, services throughout the pandemic. There's also outlying bodies we need to thank, especially Falkirk Delivers, I know I was greatly involved in food banks. I would imagine most of the elected members at that time were greatly involved in trying to maintain some sort of a um, level uh, situation within our communities. So I think we should send a loud and clear message out to um, all the people who, while others were in lockdown and shielding, were out there on the front line and maintaining a level of service uh, within our district. Thank you very much, Councillor Spears. I, I totally agree with you. Do you have any questions on the report at the moment? I haven't been saying anything to uh -huh. uh, Okay. But I'm sure that will be forthcoming. Dependent on the second. Thank you. Mr. Laurie so, had his hand up. Yeah, Would thank you, Convener. I, I just wanted to pick up on the, the, the point about consistency of measurement. I mean, I, I would say that the, the consistency of measurement across councils is, is very high. There are very clear definitions for 
um, indicators. There's a lot of work done to ensure that consistency. So I, I think whilst in the whilst during the early days of the benchmarking framework, there were significant issues um, around about consistency. I think that is much less of an issue now because of the clarity of decisions and the joint work um, done uh, between councils. As I say, I think the really important point about comparability is that Falkirk, uh, the, the, the councils are very different in terms of their geography, their scale and their levels of deprivation. But I think the, um, the measurement issue is one which is um, uh, dealt with pretty well generally. Thank you, Mr Laurie, for uh, clarifying that point. Thank you. Provis Bissett, do you have a question? Yes, uh, thanks, Jim. Um, uh, given that we've, we've been through COVID, I uh, think we'll probably take at least another year or so to, to, to get some proper shut down. Can you hear me okay? Sorry, can you put the, the microphone off in the room just when you're. Yeah, perfect. It's just the echo. It means we can't hear remotely. Sorry, thank you. Okay. Um, I, so I'll probably take at least another year. So we get a kind of levelling out of these comparators, given that we're coming into COVID, so it produced its own difficulties. But uh, the first question I'd like to ask is, page 14, 6.3, 57%, that's 47 of indicators, were shown to be deteriorating. This is significantly, this is significant, especially compared to last year, which sat at 36%. Does this indicate that performance has worsened? And what mitigations are in place to improve performance? Thank you. Mr. Laurie, can you answer that question, please? Yes, thank you, um, convener. Um, I mean, in, in um, straightforward terms, uh, to answer Councillor Business' question. Yes, I mean, there are a majority um, of indicators that have declined in the current uh, in, in the year to 2021. 20, uh, I mean, that pattern is not significantly different from other councils. And there are a number of um, indicators where um, because of the challenges of COVID, because a different way that um, services were um, provided, there was almost uh, inevitable that was going to be declined. I suppose that um, uh, and each of the, the 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 service directors would have a you know a clearer overview of their own service areas. But the, the, I think the value of this is rather than looking at that that kind of overall level is to 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 go into um, particular indicators and understand perhaps if they've declined, why they've declined, um, have they declined both here and in other councils, or is there a reason why a particular indicator has declined in Falkirk, but even though it's improved. Elsewhere, and it's it's that at that kind of level of granularity, we begin to understand, um, you know, what the key issues might be um, for the council. But I suppose my overall comment would be, yes, we've um, uh, we have seen a, de a decline that appears to be replicated um, quite widely across Scotland. That's largely about COVID, but it's also about the increasing um, financial squeeze. And that's why I made my comment um, earlier on my introductory statements um, that you know, the, the Accounts Commission in its uh, uh, national overview report for local government is um, predicting that uh, given the financial situation, we are likely to see um, uh, declines uh, or declining levels of, of, of performance. The important thing for the council is to decide which of these indicators are measuring things which are of importance to us and ensure these are the ones where we're focusing our resource and energy and driving improvement. Um, I hope that uh, at least partially uh, addresses your question, Councillor Bissett. Does that answer your question, Councillor Bissett? Yeah, I think that's going to be a similar response uh, for a lot of the questions. Um, my next question is in a similar vein and I'll probably provoke the same response. Page 15, 6.4, 46%, that's 41 indicators perform below the national average, which is significantly greater compared to last year, which sat at 29%. So what is the specific reason behind that? Is it, as you said, is it COVID? Is it financial uh, instability? You know, the challenges we face or I wonder if it's, if it's the same answer you're going to give me or 
Is there something else behind that? Well, through you, um, convener. Um, I mean, in a sense, it, it is the um, it is the um, the same answer. But the, I think the the importance of it is again looking at particular indicators and understanding why they've um, uh, declined or why performance is um, has reduced relative to the um, the Scottish average. So there are these general factors. That's absolutely correct. But these general factors, of course, impacted on all councils. And there, there will be specific um, factors in relation to different um, services and different indicators where the um, the council's performance has been particularly um, particularly affected. And and even um, for example, if if you look at the um, indicators which relate to the use of sport and leisure um, facilities. Um, average cost of use, etc., where actually historically focal performance has been poor because of the number of leisure centres um, we have um, and the relatively low usage we have for each of them. Um, but our position there further declined in this current year because in a number of other councils, these centres were used um, for, for COVID. Um, uh, for COVID testing or, 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 or other facilities, so lots of people went in. So there's an example of where COVID specifically disrupted a particular indicator. And because some uh, councils were using sports centres um, in order to deal with COVID, their numbers went up. And because we weren't doing that, um, our, pos our position relatively declined. So as I say, I think the, 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 the real understanding of that lies in different service areas and different indicators. That's just one example uh, where COVID has had a particular impact in Falkirk. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Does that answer your question, Provost Bissett? Thank you. Next question, we've got a question from Councillor Michael John. Thank you, um, convener. Um, I actually, my, what I was going to ask um, uh, Mr Laurie's actually just answered in relation to the costs around the, the leisure services and um, visits to museums etc. However, um, what is going to be more important is what we then do with this information um, and take that into any improvement plan going forward um, in order to be able to actually improve in some of our, our indicators. Um, but I think um, that there's an awful lot in here that can be positive if we look at um, particularly around um, our, our, our children and entertainment um, where there has been significant progress made. Um, however, we should not sit back in our laurels and, and, and um, pat ourselves on the back. We should be looking to um, make sure we continue to maintain that and to, to look to improve on that and, and going forward. But um, I think that's that's where you know we need to take it in a bit of, of um, Cognizance from us is, you know, what we're going to do about where we're not performing, um, in order that we can actually achieve better, um, and um, look at where we can stretch ourselves with those that we are actually achieving. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Councillor Miko. Join that was a really good point. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Uh, Councillor Robertson. Thank you, convener. Uh, again, page 15, 6.4, 50%, 44 of the indicators perform better than the Scottish average. Uh, what lessons have been learned from this? Again, Mr Laurie, could you answer that question? Thank you. I mean, in, in, in terms of learning, um, we learn about improvement and the actions we need to take and how we change services in relation to individual um, indicators. So um, I suppose just to pick up on the one the leader mentioned that I touched on previously, some of these leisure um, indicators. So we know that our, um, our costs are high per visit compared to um, other councils. Well, I mean, that tells us something quite um, basic in a way about in our position in terms of the number of buildings we have, the quality of the services we provide, and therefore their um, ability to attract 
members of the public. And we know, for example, that some other um, councils have made significant strides in terms of their um, leisure estates, investing in it, rationalising it, and that has had a very positive impact on um, these indicators. And because we, we regard these as important measures, these, these ones are going to sit within our, our council plan because it's a clear area where we need to uh, improve. Having said that, um, and just to touch on the issue of attainment, so in attainment, our, um, our, our performance is very high. We're in the top quartile for most of these uh, measures, but we'll also be putting these in the corporate plan because we recognise that in terms of prospects for our young people, that educational attainment is you know, fundamental to their future life chances. So these are also going to be in the council plan because we recognise that for all of the good performance we have, that has to be a continuing um, area of focus. So what lies behind this is that for many of these indicators, there is a network of officers working that area of service who liaise um, on a national uh, basis, learn from each other, um, find out who's performing best and, and try and replicate that that performance. And I, I think that as a council, Falkirk at this stage is very engaged in that national uh, improvement work. So as I say, I think for us, the really the, the, the important thing through the council plan is identify which of the indicators are really important to us and where we want to improve performance, whether they're in the top quartile or whether in the, they're in the bottom quartile, and then ensure that our efforts are in, in driving forward performance in these areas. And indeed, in terms of our best value um, review, and Rebecca mentioned this earlier, what the Accounts Commission do not expect us to do is just try and improve all indicators because they realise that our resources will not stretch to that. What they expect us to do is have a very clear sense of which ones are important to us and focus on improving these indicators. And that's and that's our um, approach across the piece. Thank you. Councillor Robertson, did that, was that helpful and informative for you? Yes, it was very informative, thank you. Um, Councillor Forrest, you have a question, please? Yes, thanks. I, let's see, I lost it there. Uh, page 16, 6.6, .6. could we have clarity uh, on what is meant by SCHN1, the cost per primary school pupil in pounds. Thank you. Mr Naylor, uh, did you hear that question? Could you answer that, please? Thank you. Uh, the cost per primary school pupil is is a measure whereby um, there's a calculation done on our expenditure in the primary sector in total, divided by the number of primary school pupils that we have, um, and that is done similarly across the other 31 local authorities, and then they are ranked in order. So this this particular indicator shows that our primary school delivery is very efficient. Did that clarify, Councillor Forrest? Oh, yeah. could, uh, could you be just a little bit more specific in what costs there are per child, is including, you know, is I, I take it it's I, the hardware of providing the service, such as the schools, the equipment, I, as opposed to wages, etc. Could you just do a wee breakdown for there? Is it, it's the, the total expenditure, so it does include the wages of teachers, of support staff, of catering and cleaning staff, um, of the, the cost of the building, of the heating, of the lighting, um, the cost of the central, central, central team, team 
proportionally allocated to the primary sector. Um, the cost, for example, of education psychology services and other support services that work within the primary sector. So it's so it's 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 a measure of the totality of our expenditure um, on primary schooling. That's grand. Thank you very much. I thank you for your comprehensive answer, Mr. Naylor. Um, I have another question from Councillor Nico John, please. Apologies, convener, that was a legacy. Um, but it's just to say that the noise from the town hall room is, is very, very difficult. I don't know whether it's your, your microphone, um, convener, that's causing a lot of feedback, but it's making it quite difficult to hear. Yeah, I only turn it on when I speak, so I'm not sure the problem. It's something maybe we can look at, actually. Any more questions? Uh, Councillor Robertson. Again, page 16, 6.5. Uh, with 14 indicators being placed in the bottom eight of councils in Scotland, would e external communication with councils who perform better be, be possible? Uh, do we measure performance differently in other councils? Mr. Laurie, are you able to answer that question? Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, um, convener. No, the, the the consistency in measurement is 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 very high. So it's not that we're measuring these um, indicators differently um, from others. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier the um, the work that's done in, in kind of officer groups to compare and contrast um, uh, performance. And um, so certainly there are mechanisms and opportunities to learn from other councils who might be uh, performing better um, than us on these um, uh, these indicators the, um, that we find. They're set out at 6.7, the indicators that sit within um, the, the, the bottom quartile. Some of these we've touched on already in terms of um, sport and leisure um, and cultural um, facilities, but they are arranged there and we are um, for those that are significant to us, um, we will be working with other councils to try and um, improve our performance and get higher up the uh, LGBF table. Is that OK? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lorry. Uh, next question, we have another question from uh, Councillor Aitchison, please. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, it's page 28, the appendix one. It's regarding the percentage, percentage of the highest paid 5% employees who are women. Um, this figure has remained unchanged through 2018-2021. Um, could we maybe find out what has been done to address this situation and to encourage more women into these positions, please? Karen, are you able to answer this question? Thank you. Yes, I am. Thank you, convener. Um, it's it's what this is a it's a good question, councillor, and it's. Um, a figure where you try and at least get around the 50% mark, and that is indeed where we are, because what we don't want to have is an imbalance of um, females, which this uh, figure is actually intended to um, measure. But equally, you don't want an imbalance where you have um, a very small number of males and no female uh, and too many females. So that could swap it the other way. So we have fairly consistently been sitting around that 50% mark. And I was just looking at the, the figures for, for this year up to date, and we are still sitting around 53% female and 46% male. Much of this is dependent on um, recruitment practices. We can't simply go out and recruit females, but we can make sure that our recruitment practices are gender neutral and that we are as fair as possible following all of the equality legislation in terms of those practices. And that we make sure things like our adverts are open, they're transparent and they are gender neutral as well, because what you don't want to do is deter um, females or males uh, or ethnic minorities. So it's about getting that real balance right across the equality spectrum um, for that particular figure. So I hope that helps answer that question. Thanks. Yeah, I totally agree, Karen. It was a very thorough answer. Thank you. Thank you. 
thank you. Th thank you, Karen. And I just want to mention at this point where I'm sure all the councillors and all the staff are delighted that yourself and Amanda have been appointed as chief officers to this this year, which is excellent. Thank you. Another question now for Laura Murta, Councillor Murta, please. Sorry. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I suppose just picking up, and partly the Chief Executive um, kind of answered part of this early, earlier, and there's been some discussion about the the consistency rates and about the measurement, um, and and then particularly note that the Chief Executive's answered about reassuring that actually there is a there is already a, a lot of work that uh, goes into understanding how uh, councils are reporting um, each of these metrics to, to try and get that consistent position and therefore um, you know the thing which which would you know kind of uh, lead to concern would, would be when we're in more the kind of quartile the bottom quartiles of that and if, if they are indeed consistent I suppose it just reading through the report in certain metrics that and we touched already on the the kind of um, situation of sport and leisure, and perhaps how different councils have been reporting uh, the visits differently, or online visits, or counting different things. And that's an example where maybe there was a bit of variance, and that could have then put us further down um, the ranking in, in that particular metric. Where if we'd been counting it the same way, we would be further up. And I know that obviously uh, within the service which which I'm portfolio holder for for sport and leisure, certainly exploring with officers how we can understand that better rather than just anecdotally note it you know how we can actually look and say well are, how are we sure about that uh, and, and therefore when we're looking at improvements where can we actually target for that and um, so i suppose my question is really about some of those other metrics if we are actually um more um confident that they are consistently being applied that then we're looking at where well, okay um you know the, the quartet where we're we're much further down and specifically analysing in each service with uh, the other councils then where there are improvements so we can so we can get some more quality data out of what those those mean because I'm not sure sometimes in the report it does actually say um, that we we don't think that the measurement is like for like as Council Benny was saying apples with apples or apples with oranges so it's it's just to sort of balance out not it's not a contradiction in what was being said but but just there are a few concerns then that you know how we're approaching that if we're approaching it across the board of looking at that analysis uh, where we are uh, kind of in the lower quartiles and where we've obviously dipped and um, so that we can can get better analysis rather than just a sort of anecdotal within the report that we think you know that it's to do with COVID or we think it's to do with the way that it's been reported can we get some assurance that there's some analysis on each of those please <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Murcher. That was a very good question. Uh, Mr Laurie, can you answer that, please? Um, thank you, Convener. I'll, I'll certainly endeavour to um, to do so. I mean, is, there is a huge amount of detail that underlies um, all of this. Um, you know, Re Rebecca mentioned at the beginning, you, you can go on to the, um, through the improvement service, get all of that information for all um, councils, and indeed look back over the full um, now 11 years of the local government benchmarking framework and see how performance has changed over that period. So, um, I mean, there were specifically, just to come back to the point, there were some inconsistencies round about COVID, but I, I think in a way that was my view of it, more inconsistencies of a um, approach to the utilization of facilities rather than inconsistencies in measurement, though there may be some of the um, the latter as well, because um, just because I suppose the sheer disruptive um, impact of COVID on so many services, and indeed in some cases on the on the ability to devote resources to uh, issues such as performance, when actually the frontline matters were obviously of overwhelming um, importance. So, whilst we have an eleven-year time series now for the majority of these indicators, though some of them, such as climate change, are are newer. You across a whole range of them, including attainment, you do see a significant shifts and changes in the last two periods. And I think retrospectively, um, and, and, and the point was made earlier in the meeting, you know, things are going to settle down a bit. I think 21, 22 will also be a year where there's some uh, uh, variances and uh, unpredictabilities in the data as a result of COVID, and then we'll settle back, we hope, into a rather more normal and um, more normal pattern. 
But what I would say is that for any indicator where our performance is relatively poor and where we think it's important to improve that um, performance because it is a priority for us, there is both a lot of data and a, and a network that we can tap into that to help us improve what we're doing and uh, move forward on that on, on that basis. Thank you. Does that answer it, uh, Councillor Murta, for you? It, it, it does, does absolutely. The last part, the sorry, there's still that FA. Um, okay. Councillor Benny, could you turn? Thank you. Sorry, uh, it's a complicated uh, echo system there. And um, that last part does uh, answer it in, in particular, but I think it's perhaps from previous experience, and, and uh, I previously uh, sat on scrutiny committee and remember this report coming forward and, and perhaps analysed it uh, more than, I, than I, I should have, but it gave me a real insight into, for example, at that time we were uh, sitting 32 out of 32 on the cost per planning application and I think more than double probably even the person at 31, but actually what was uncovered through that scrutiny process in that report was indeed the way that we were reporting it and also in comparison to similar local authorities, you know, we're not necessarily going to, to compare with, uh, you know, the, the planning situation in, in rural Highland or etc. So then understanding actually um, we were we were not comparing apples with apples in that situation and take the point that a lot of work has been done over the last five years to improve the consistency of reporting. But I think that that exercise said to me that where, where there were, particularly where we're sitting in the bottom quartile and we're able to then look at that data was, was an, a useful exercise in making that improvement, which we were able to do on that particular metric. So it's just that last reassurance the Chief Executive gave is, 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 is important, but definitely I think um, it's useful to, for us, particularly where we are in that red or du double amber, a triple amber, to, to be able to look at that and make sure. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Murta. Uh, we have. Uh, it's page 29, uh, code SHSN5. Uh, the percentage of, uh, on the percentage of council houses that are energy efficient, uh, what does energy efficient make reference uh, to? Are heating systems including, included in this? Uh, and although we are doing better than the Scottish average, what measures are being taken to improve the figure further? Karen, are you able to answer this question? Thank you. I am convener, thank you. Um, the figure relates to um, all different methods of work that we're doing to look at energy efficiency. So it does include heating, um, but we look at a range of different things and we're looking at different measures such as our heating systems, but also things such as the new windows and doors um, contract that we've got out about replacing new windows and doors, which clearly helps with um, energy efficiency and also things like rendering houses, which is about upgrading how we how those houses can retain heat. So all of these factors play into that and it's something that we we actively work on. Thank you. Your question, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Karen. Yes, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Another question now from Councillor Forrest, please. Yeah, I again, this one will probably be for uh, Mr. Naylor. Uh, it's page 222, SCHN3, and it's while I noticed that the cost of the preschool places in 2018 19 were £5,517.92, I just a couple of years later, uh, in 2021, this cost had risen to quite a considerable £9,426.68. Uh, over those years indicated, that's a rise of £3,908.76. Uh, first of all, I, the I, Scotland value was £9,254.90. Now, I take it that this was the due to the expansion of the nursery provision within Falkirk. I was, can I ask, was there any financial assistance given to Falkirk from the Scottish Government to offset this increase in costs and uh, increase the investment in our children's future? Thank you, and through you, Chair. Uh, yes, Councillor, um, the 
the increase in cost is entirely associated with a, a move towards a 1140 hours entitlement for every preschool child. Um, the expansion of early years was funded <coughs> entirely by the Scottish <laughs> Government through ring fence funding. Um, it continues to be ring fence funding and we expect that that will be the case for at least one more year. But you, the jump that you've noticed from 6,800 to 9,400 is to do with that expansion from uh, what was 600 hours provision up to 1140 hours provision over the course of a two to three year period of impl implementation. That's lovely. Thank you very much. I and as I asked earlier, it, there was funding from the Scottish Government to offset the costs. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have another question now from Councillor Spears, please. No, you have no question from me. My hand's not up. I beg your pardon, sorry. Another question from Councillor Aitchison, please. Thanks, Convener. It's two questions regarding the um, housing, um, and it's page nine on Appendix 1. It's SHS N2 and SHS N4B. Um, the, the council rent that has been lost due to houses remaining empty has risen from 1.04% to 1.58%, and I would suggest this is money that the council could ill afford to lose. Um, what has been done to remedy that situation and also the average time taken to complete non-emergency repairs has virtually doubled over the last couple of years um, and it's near enough double the national uh, thing as well. So um, again, what's been done to try and solve those issues? Thank you, Councillor Aitchison. Karen, is that a question you could answer? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, on the, the first question around rent arrears, um, you will see in some of the text that's in the report that some of that has been impacted by the way that we um, worked with um, tenants to collect rent arrears and that was all done face to face. So a lot of that will have been impacted by COVID. We've looked at how we can change some of that, but we're also working quite um, hard on uh, those particular factors. So that work is in hand. On the housing repairs question, yeah, it's disappointing to see those figures, but I think it's help, uh, it'd be beneficial for me to highlight to members, particularly the new members to the committee, that in previous years, our performance was um, fairly good on uh, the, the repairs but, um, for this, for non-emergency repairs. Over the period of the pandemic, however, um, and some of this is in the report, you will know that we had a number of restrictions in the way that we could run the repair service. So we could not carry out the repairs to the full extent that we were able to um, pre the pandemic. We had restrictions such as um, the number of people that could be in houses, the way they could work, social distancing, etc. At that point, we focused very much on emergency repairs to make sure that the safety of tenants was, was the priority, but also focused on things like our statutory requirements, such as homelessness, and trying to ensure that we got houses ready for anyone that was homeless in that, in that period. As a result, we did have a backlog of somewhere in the region of over 7,000 um, outstanding jobs. Now, what I would say is that some councils simply told their tenants they couldn't do those jobs and took them off the system. We kept all of those uh, requests for uh, work on our system and we've continued now to work through them. So of those 7,000 jobs, we have only around 400 that remain to be completed. So we have done a huge amount of work since the figures that you've got in the report were reported. There's been a huge amount of work done to get through that backlog. And we're hoping that by next month, that backlog will have been sorted. And we should see as we move forward an improvement in the figures. And I hope that helps answer the question. 
Um, the first part of my question was actually about um, houses remaining empty, not about rent and arrear, rent arrears. It's money that's being lost through empty housing. And the second part, I totally appreciate your answer, but um, the regulations would have been the same for all local authorities. So for Falkirk to have become, the figures are twice what it was in 1819 is really disappointing. It'd be happy to come back in on those points. Um, on the second part, absolutely, I, I agree that those are not the figures we would want to see. Um, but hopefully the, the fact that we've now worked through those um, has given you the assurance that we have taken a lot of action to put steps in place to address that situation. You're absolutely right. The guidance, the national guidance was absolutely the same for all local authorities and we have stuck to that rigidly. Now, we, we know that there are some situations where um, what, what the regulations required us to do was to keep those requests for repairs on the system, but we do know that in some case councils that may not have been the case. Now, I think what's important here is that we are getting through that backlog and that we're actually taking positive actions to address that. On the first question about um, void properties, we have put in place um, some additional arrangements and additional contracts to try and help us address the situation with void properties. And I'm happy to get you more information on that, Councillor, if that would be of help. Thanks, Karen. That would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Just just on that point, I was just going to say that's really good that we're just maybe a month away from catching up with the backlog of the non-emergency. That's really good to hear. Thank you. And there's, has anybody got any more questions at this point? Uh, Provis Bissett, I believe you have. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Page 25, Appendix 1. SC and L1 and plan cost per attendance of sport and leisure facilities, including swimming pools. There is a considerable increase compared to 2019-20, the 2019-20 value, as well as a significant gap between our value £81.44 compared to the Scottish value of £40.36. Have any improvement plans been implemented to improve this as we were still above the national average prior to the pandemic. Thank you, Provost Bissett. Mr Naylor, are you able to answer this? Thank you. Yep. Yes, uh, convener. Um, Councillor Bissett, the, the, the figure as you say was high even before the, the pandemic. The pandemic clearly didn't help the, the situation. Fundamentally, the, the issue here is that we have a arguably over provision of swimming pools and facilities in the Falkirk area. Many other councils have only uh, swimming pools that are, that are public swimming pools. They don't have swimming pools um, in, in, in every town as, as we do. Um, so one of the things that we will be looking to do now that the, the trust has returned to the council and sport and leisure sits within children's services is we will be looking at the totality of that provision where it exists and what our opening hours are because it is an area where there's significant improvement needed in terms of, of the cost per visit. Does that answer your question, Provis Bissett? Okay, yes, I yes, think fine, fine. Thank you. Do we have any further questions? Uh, Councillor Forrest, please. Hi, thanks. I, sorry, one more question for Mr Naylor, if you don't mind. I, it's just something leading off from I, page 22.2, SCHN3 again. So sorry about this. I, the cost of each school, preschool place in Falkirk is 1000 uh, 700 and uh, sorry 1701 pound 78p above the scottish value of the 2021 figure could you explain the difference please the, the, the difference is uh, attributed to the fact that we include within that calculation expenditure on all children in the, the pre-5 setting and what what we have had for many years is baby provision um, where we have two centres where we have children from zero to two. Uh, the costs of that service are significant. 
It's a cost that very, very few councils uh, have, uh, but it is included in our figures and we ha we have uh, on this particular met metric been a uh, more costly than the Scottish average for many years, but that's the reason for it. Thank you, uh, Mr Naylor, and very worthwhile too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Forrest. Um, I, have, I have a question, uh, Mr Neil. I just want to come back in, if you don't mind. I'm, I'm a keen swimmer, you see. You mentioned there's over-provision of swimming pools and leisure. Um, so you said you were going to look at that. Um, can you give us a, a time scale when you'll come back and give us a report on that, please? And that be obviously linked to the strategic property view. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people in our communities would be interested in that as well, actually, and how it impacts every ward. Thank you, convener. No, no concrete uh, proposals as yet. What I can confirm, though, is that we are looking at um, the, the various places that we have swimming pools. We're looking at which sessions are um, best attended. We're looking at what the income is that we get from having swimming pools open and we're also doing some early benchmarking with other council areas in terms of what their provision is uh, across their council areas. So, so, so when I said this is something that we're looking at, that is the stage that we are at um, and there will be proposals forthcoming um, to improve this measure uh, in, in the next months. Thank you, Mr. Naylor. Uh, Councillor Spears, I believe, has got a question. His hand is up. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, I much appreciated your interjection there. Uh, a very relevant question. I, I would hate the message to go out from Mr. Naylor that there could be some cutback in our leisure facilities. Uh, because he feels there's over provision. Benchmarking with other councils is all very well, but we're here to provide a service for the people here in Falkirk District, and that's right across the district. So I hope we're not talking about any closures of swimming pools here. Mr Naylor, could you come in there? Is that something you're still looking at? So. Um, I take it. Uh, I'm not going to answer your question. Any closure of swimming pools will be de a decision taken by Falkirk Council. Is that well, 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 scrutiny meeting here uh, ascertain if what our um, executive, our education? Um, leader is telling us. So I'm asking you again, are you telling us that swimming pools could close? Swimming pools could close. Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you. Provis Bissett, I believe you've got a question. Thank you. Thanks for your indulgence. Um, um, aye. Aye. aye, so my final question, uh, page 22, appendix 1, SC and L2 in the plan, cost per visit to libraries. There's a considerable increase compared to 2019-20 value as well as a significant gap between our value £24.79 compared to the Scottish value of £2.88 per visit. What mechanisms are in place to increase footfall again and what plans are in place to reduce the cost considering we were above the national average prior to the pandemic? Now, I know Mr Gillespie and his team are doing some an awful lot of work in that, but given that this meeting is live streamed, I think I would just like to the public to hear an answer of what we're planning to do with libraries. Thank you. Is that yourself, Karen? Thank you, Dan. Thank you. It says, convener. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a very good question, Councillor Bissett, and we were very conscious of um, the LGBF indicators when we saw these about the need to actively look at 
the library activities and make sure that we were proactive in terms of responding to these figures. So what we are in the process of doing is pulling together a range of actions which will come to Falkirk Council on 28th of September for consideration. And part of that will be about developing a five year plan for libraries to try and address some of those issues. It's fair to say that there's still um, out with that, there's still a lot of work going on in libraries to encourage footfall and things like um, the inclusion of the hub within libraries has been a positive addition, which also gives um, residents the ability to come into libraries, but to uh, as well as visitor hubs, but to also get support for other things when they're actually in there. So it's how we can maximise the use of libraries through other service um, introductions as well. And we're looking at all of those things. Thanks. Does that answer it, uh, Provost Bissett, for you? Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Councillor Forrest, a question. Good. One last question from me, if you don't mind. It's page 32, tackling climate change. SCLMI, SCLIM01. The CO2 emissions uh, area wide per capita in 2018-19 were 14 0.76%. I gradually went down in uh, the following year and went down slightly more in the following year of 2021 down to 13.28. Well, the bench benchmark of uh, benchmark of the Scotland value is 4.62%. While I note that this is being monitored and it is being reduced slowly and gradually, I note that even in the lowest figure, of 2021, it's still almost three times the Scottish value. Can we find out, please, what the reason for this high figure is in comparison to the Scottish value, the impact on the local communities, and any measures that are being undertaken, you know, to try and resolve this? Because this is really quite important. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely, Councillor Forrest. Um, I'd like Mr Benny to come in. Could you maybe um, give us some more information on the, regarding the question? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, that particular indicator reflects Falkirk as an area and um, elected members will be aware that um, Falkirk contains Grangemouth, which is um, one of Scotland's largest um, uh, hubs for industry and uh, biggest uh, emitters of carbon. So uh, I think that's just a natural reflection of um, the um, landscape that we uh, we have in front of us. Obviously, um, uh, Ineos and other companies have um, made commitments about moving to a, a carbon reduction model and, and we'll see benefits um, as they come forward. But I think the probably the more relevant PI in terms of what we can actually control is the uh, one below that um, with regard to um, uh, emissions within the scope of the local authority. Um, and you'll see that um, on that basis, we're um, uh, performing um, much better. The other part of the question was what measures are being undertaken to try and resolve this? Are we in constant talks with uh, the perpetrators of this? I think with the greatest respect, we, through you, Convener, we don't have a kind of locus to dictate terms to businesses in our local area, but, you know, uh, I'm pleased that um, uh, local, major local employers um, and uh, businesses are um, making public commitments to um, transition to greener energy. So um, I don't, I don't believe um, uh, we're in a place where we need to. Um, I think we should welcome those announcements and uh, look forward with interest to see how they progress. Councillor Forrest, does that answer your question? Uh, well, as far as it goes, yes, so but obviously okay. we, this is something that we're going to have to keep an eye on yes. and would appreciate a report back at a later date. 
And on, on that point, Mr. Ben, I totally agree with you how important any is is in Grange for the um, the benefit of everybody in our communities and that. But I think it might be helpful, you know, as we as councillors, if we could find out the steps that NAS is taking, not that we wish to interfere because you said that they're a private company and it is beneficial for our area to have that company there. So even just sort of finding out the steps they're taking, uh, just a little bit more understanding because I realise it's very, very technical, but I really think that would be helpful. So is that uh, possible maybe to get some of that information and share with the councillors? Because it's one of the biggest employers in the area and obviously it's got the biggest impact to our CO2 emissions. And whether we control that or not, it's helpful as a community to understand, you know, what, what they are doing. Is that, is that a helpful counsellor for us? Absolutely, convener. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Not at all. Uh, yeah, through you, convener. Uh, very happy to um, ask my economic development colleagues to prepare a briefing that updates on uh, the commitments of um, INEOS and other um, large uh, private businesses in the Grangemouth area and across Falkirk in terms of uh, commitments. Um, and I'll, I'll get that yeah. to all elected members. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Do we have, um, I've got Councillor Thompson. <laughs> Thank you, Convener. One final question. Thanks. Uh, page 29, SECON2, uh, cost per planning application. Uh, why, if planning application numbers fall, does it get more expensive? Mr. Benny, if you could come in there, would that be possible? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, through you, convener. Um, I'll get more information on this, but uh, often sometimes um, applications of a more significant nature, larger in scale, can generate greater fees. And if you don't have those coming through, then the overall income that the service receives goes down. So um, uh, it's not a it's not as easy as just to say, is it like per number of applications is is the scale but let me get more information on you uh on that for you um i'm happy to share that with the scrutiny committee as well does that help councillor roberts yes thank you mr benny thank you i'm now nearly at the end and uh, i must admit it's been a really engaging uh, question and answer and i've got to thank all the members and all the officers as well for participating. So I'm just going to come in here and say, has anybody got any more questions before we finish up? Sorry. Um, the recommendations, sorry, I forgot about the important part. Um, yes, <coughs> Mr. Peary will do the next part, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, that wasn't very elegant. Um, so the committee were asked to note the report and scrutinise the council's performance uh, and they were scrutinising with a view to seeing if there was any reports they wanted to bring forward um, which would possibly feed into their recommendations to the council plan. Don't think the, the committee has actually asked for reports. I, I note there's a couple of briefing reports coming back. Um, Mr Benny just referred to just towards the end. And I think the, the committee also noted that Council will look at its council plan and develop its uh, framework of indicators that determines are the, the priority ones. And I think Rebecca said at the start that these will be reported to scrutiny committee. So perhaps today it's just to note the report and be aware that there will be future reports coming on key performance indicators. And that's what the scrutiny committee may want to, to delve deeper into, into reports. But for just now, it's just noting the report. Thank you very much, Mr. Perry. And again, I want to thank all the members and all the officers for participating in the scrutiny committee today. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. Well done, well done. Good